her problem. What does it say in Lawrence? And that's the in Pepro. It's the Lawrence Library in Pepro. And they're muted. I don't know oh. if they realize they're muted. All, right. All righty, let's get started. So welcome, welcome. This is Hey Soil. What's going on down there? A an event organized by the Pepro Climate Change Committee. Um, so whether you're here in person or on Zoom, welcome, you know, get settled in and get ready for some exciting learning. But first, no, this event would not have been possible without all of our community support, including you all. So I wanted to thank the library for letting us host this event here. Um, we'd also like to give a shout out to our four co-sponsors, the Pepperell, um, the Pepperell Agricultural Commission, Pepperell's Native and Invasive Plant Committee, the Nashua River Watershed Association, and the Neshoba Conservation Trust. All of these wonderful organizations are doing a lot around sustainability for our community and for the world. So we appreciate them. And lastly, the Pepperell Cultural Council provided financial backing for this program. And this program and this talk is actually part of a larger program um, called Loving a Leak and the Soil It Grows in, The Art and Science of Soil Microbes. Yes, I said loving a leak, L-E-E-K as in the onion. <laughs> um, and this project is actually the brainchild of our very own Sue Edwards. She is a former climate change committee member and also is on the board of the Nashua River Watershed <laughs> Association. She's there in the back there. <laughs> um, and her inspiration for this project actually came while she was volunteering at Upswing Farm. And um, she was really marveling at the health and the taste of the vegetables grown on this local farm, this local organic farm. And so, uh, hopefully we can all be inspired by vegetables and soil. And um, Karen is going to tell us a little bit more about this project. So this project is going to ultimately culminate uh, early this summer. And the culmination will be a, an art exhibit here held at the Lawrence Library in the gallery. And the exhibit will feature um, all kind, well, pictures of different kinds, I'm assuming, of uh, vegetables and soil organisms and microorganisms. Amazing, amazing pictures. And, um, and that's the, I just keep thinking the culmination of that is just the entry into what's next. So, um, so please be on the lookout for that. And we will have an email uh, list here for you if you would like to be notified of that. And if you are uh, on Zoom and you want to put your email address onto the Zoom chat, then we can get that off of that also. So uh, my name is Karen Rurkin and Tarumi uh, just sort of introduced herself. This is Tarumi Okano and we're both members of the Pepperell Climate Change Committee. And we would like to provide yet another shout out to Sue Edwards. Sue, please stand up for a second. <laughs> and receive the applause that you so deserve for bringing this to fruition. She, she carried it all the way. So we are deeply thankful to Sue and then to all of the other organizations that have been mentioned. I don't know if they'll add a few, but they can do that and we'll thank them too. So uh, one thing about uh, today is that uh, John and Ruben will be telling you how they want to handle questions, but just in case anybody has any others, we will uh, have a little time after the presentation for Q&A. And for the people that are on Zoom, 
uh, we can take your questions through the chat and hopefully answer all of them before you leave, which we are hoping we'll be wrapping up at about 8.15 tonight. Uh, I, think, I think that's it. Let's get on with the show. And so with that, I would be delighted to introduce um, John Duke and Ruben Perla from the Northeast uh, Organic Farming Association, which we will come to know well as NOFA in the months and years ahead, indeed. And they are very, very passionate about soil. And we are hoping that every single person in this room will be too by the end of this presentation. How's that for a setup? Right. Yeah. All right. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the library and thank you for all the sponsors. Uh, you are here uh, for this talk, right? So let's start. Go ahead and get started. Um, so let's see. Maybe just do a double check with Zoom land, make sure that uh, everybody's hearing us. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if I can get a uh, thumbs up or anything on the chat for those that are on Zoom. Uh, can you hear us clear? Perfect. You're pretty clear. Thank you. All right. So uh, before we get uh, to our talk, I do want to make an land acknowledgement. We are presenting today this uh, talk um, at the uh, uh, unceded Nimuk territory. And I do want to make that land acknowledgement uh, before we start. Um, for those that are not familiar, uh, there is a link here that you can go on and look at your own uh, area uh, of where you reside. So um, do take a moment to uh, find your uh, the land that you now occupy. Uh, we did go over this already. Uh, these are some of our sponsors. Um, and the only one that we would want to add would be the NOFA Mass, uh, but we already went through that, so... <laughs> And so this talk, uh, these are the three major points that we're gonna go over. Um, these are gonna be uh, the role of microbes uh, in flavor, nutrition, and pest resistance. So structure, carbon uptake, and sequestration. Um, and how do we encourage this in our uh, farms, gardens, or wherever you're working in land. Um, and I will go ahead and Give the floor to John. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so Sue asked us to pack a whole lot of information into a tiny little bit of time. Um, so we are gonna uh, kind of keep things moving here, um, particularly, well, the three points that we looked at, you know, like what is nutrition? Um, what is nutrition in your plant? What is nutrition in, in our own health? And how do we get that? Um, what we've come, well, what both Ruben and I uh, work mostly in is, is cultivating that microbial piece, which uh, so much of it is directly related to the soil microbiome, which in the health world, you know, people are realizing that this gut microbiome is a significant role as well. And I personally feel that the two are directly related. Um, we've depleted our soil microbiome and the cause of, we've ended up with a depleted you know gut microbiome because we've lost that connection um so there's a lot here <laughs> um this is a uh, work that a guy named John Kempf does who has a company called uh, Advancing Eco Ag um this is a nice little diagram about you know, what represents plant health and indirectly then that leads to human health. We kind of have two sections here. This bottom part of the pyramid um, is, is really more, you know, chemically based, the minerals that are in our soils and plant physiology. Uh, what are the minerals that our plants actually need? We've kind of been living down here in our food system for a long time and we only get limited health in our plants and then limited health in, in, in ourselves. Um, so this, this bottom part of the pyramid, uh, like I said, it's, uh, you know, these elements, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, all the minerals that I think we're all relatively familiar with as far as what our plants need. Um, that mineral component is required 
it's it's also in a lot of our soils. Uh, there's a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere. And the real problem is how do we get that into our plants so that these plants can actually photosynthesize up on this top part of this pyramid, which here, you this is where the microbiome comes into play. Um, and if we're gonna get nutrition in our food, we need basically more complicated molecules in these food, not just simple sugars. We need complex, um, you know, complete proteins. Uh, and the only way that we really get that is when we start having a diverse microbiome in the soil. Um, so that's this, this top part. And we start getting what's called, you know, microbial um, metabolites. And um, I think I've beaten that up enough. Um, oops, sorry. This is just a quick diagram, you know, Visually, these are relatively simple molecules. Once you start getting up into the secondary metabolites, these are complex uh, carbon chains, um, terpenes, and so forth. And that's you know sort of a, a visual piece of, of what we're trying to get at. This is where you get flavor. And I think we've all had the experience of a tomato that has no flavor. It's pretty commonplace these days. Um, you don't have nutrition unless you have flavor. Um, well, or aroma. Um, all of these plant uh, growth regulators, you know, help. This is, this is a, it's a, it's a more, it's just a complex uh, system where you've got the soil microbiome helping to function in these systems. It's not just putting down NPK, nitrogen, you know, chemical amendments, um, which is a, sort of a simple system. These plants need a little bit more. The role of the microbiome, this is a, a pretty common depiction of the soil food web, which is like many other food webs. It's, it's not just a, a, a chain. Um, all of these different organisms um, have a function and they feed off each other. They help to mineralize our soil. So that mineral component, that's the bottom part of that pyramid. It is required for plant physiology, for, for the plant to photosynthesize and to make complex foods. Those minerals are there, but those minerals aren't plant available. It's, it's a rock that the plant can't absorb. It's not um, it's not plant available. It's not water soluble. What we've done in modern ag is we've made a lot of water soluble fertilizers that the plant can readily uptake, but it's limited. Um, the microbiome, particularly bacteria and fungi, this is where it all starts. These two organisms, which there's you know millions of, but they have the ability to dissolve rocks and take that mineral component and make it plant available. Through their enzymes, they can dissolve those rocks, basically. They'll be incorporated into their body. And then when somebody higher up on this food web eats them, they're gonna poop out that mineral component that is now plant available. That's called mineral. When people talk about mineralization, it's actually a biological process. Starting with these two guys, breaking down these elements. And then when a protozoa, which there's a whole, there's flagellates and amoeba and ciliates, you know, they're gonna eat the bacteria. There's a carbon to nitrogen ratio in here that, that I, I'm not gonna get into, but you know, when, when, when he eats this bacteria, and poops out something, he's pooping out nitrogen in a plant available form. And all of this should be happening right in the rhizosphere. And the, the plant is actually driving this whole system because now the plant has the ability to photosynthesize. The plant's gonna dump these sugary exudates into the soil to feed these guys because they want sugar, everybody wants sugar. 
but the plant is actually doing it and putting out particular exudates to attract particular microbes that are efficient at bringing me particular mineral components that I need at particular times when I'm in a particular growth cycle, whether I'm in a vegetative state or a flowering state. The plant really knows how to do this quite well because it's been doing it for millions of years. Um, and if you can engage in this microbiome and support it and develop it, you can end up with a very resilient system. And once these plants start photosynthesizing at higher levels and we get to that top part of the pyramid I showed, that's not digestible anymore to a sap sucking insect. And if you really reach the top part of that pyramid, you'll see like chewing insects stop bothering your plants because you're getting now complete proteins and uh, compounds that aren't digestible to those insects. They literally move away. And you can actually see this happen in a day or two. When you address your plant's problem with nutrition, not an insecticide. The bug's actually telling you that you have a problem, that you have a nutrition problem. You don't have a bug problem. You've got a nutrition problem. And we kind of do this with our health system too. You know, when you have a headache, we take Advil. We're not Advil deficient. You have a headache because of a nutrition problem. And we're just putting a Band-Aid on it, which is what we do with pesticides. We'll spray the pesticide. We kill the insect. We didn't have a pesticide problem. We had a nutrition problem. So we still have a nutrition problem. And we just put some chemical on the food that we're going to eat. All right. <laughs> uh, uh oh, what I do here? There we go. The second part of this whole thing, when we get into the microbiome in the soil, not only is there this mineralization that's happening where these minerals are becoming plant available, but it turns out there's this rhizophagy cycle, which is sort of the next step with the soil food web. Dr. James White and actually some other folks prior to him, but he's, he's done a lot more research at Rutgers. And what they're finding is that this bacteria, well, bacteria in particular are actually being taken into the root. So it's not just this mineral component that we've been addressing for a long time. There's actually bacteria that in the tip, in the root hair of the tip, bacteria is going into the root system and the plant is getting a nutritional component from the bacteria. The plant's actually dissolving the outer skin of that bacteria getting a particularly a nitrogen there's a lot of work that they need to do here and the whole mineral component that they're getting from the bacteria we don't really know yet but there's definitely a nitrogen component particularly bacteria are with nitrogen so the plant's getting a nitrogen component maybe up to 30 percent of the nitrogen requirement from the bacteria itself and then the plant shucks them out doesn't kill them sends it out and it sends out the bacteria with uh, enough food to basically regrow that shell and it keeps it all back into the system right in the rhizosphere. So the rhizosphere is that, that interface where the root hairs are meeting the soil. That's where all the activity is happening. Um, you know, so there's two real gains here with having a, a, a rich soil microbiome with your plant. You're mineralizing the, the parent material that the plant's growing in and now you know, you're also providing a food source. Um, that also requires a whole lot less water, which is really intriguing. Um, and Ruben's gonna take it over here. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, so for this section, we're gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about soil formation um, and uh, some of the soil functions and, uh, that require that uh, soil structure. Uh, so first thing we have here is the typical uh, levels of horizons that you can see. Um, and what's important about this is uh, perhaps uh, something that, that we should all know is that the key components, and John alluded to this earlier too, 
the key components of any soil formation are the ratios of silt, sand, and clay. So silt, sand, and clay is actually the inherent part of soil functions, uh, but there's also dynamic ones, right? So the inherent ones are um, those uh, physical properties that you can see at any given, given geological location, uh, and, and thus a chemical component to that too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have those two components uh, where uh, it, you can't change what you have in your soil in terms of those physical properties uh, and chemical properties. Um, you know, for example, we are actually standing now in, a, in land where there was probably mile high of, of, of glacial till here. Um, and so over the years, uh, what causes that is time, climate, and uh, topography that actually creates this, uh, uh, the soil formation. <clears throat> Now, uh, this is just a graph here, a quick graph on, um, again, this is just an example. <laughs> Not all soils actually have this composition here. Uh, but what I do want to do is uh, shed light on uh, the different parts of the soil and what compose them, right? So we have our mineral component, uh, air and water, which are extremely essential uh, for plant health and biology as well. Uh, there's an organic matter component there at 5%. 5% uh, we consider it to be the bare minimum that you want to have in your agricultural soils. Um, but oh, yeah. there's no established rate of how high that can get. Um, and that's just, you know, a, a way to visualize um, what you should be seeing in your soil. So now um, there are... While we have, like I, I like like I mentioned already, while we do have inherent properties, the dynamic properties are those are actually biological. And uh, when you start to look at certain soils, the biological factor is perhaps the most important factor in the formation of soil structure, uh, especially around here where we actually have a lot of sandy soil. Uh, what's causing the soil structure to occur are the microbes, right? So let's go over a few of the biology. I'm not going to go over because there's a ton of biology and, and there's soil ecology that we still don't understand quite frankly. Um, so, but these are some of the ones that we actually can talk about. So who are the ones who are actually creating that soil structure that is needed for proper plant uh, production and uh, the health of our plants, right? Um, let's start with earthworms. Uh, earthworms are essential for creating soil structure, but word of caution, um, and as this group may already know, not all earthworms are created equal. Uh, we have uh, four different types of equal physiological earthworms. There's an esic, an uh, endogeic, epigeic, and epiendogeic. The epiendogeic, uh, which, which we all know as these jumping worms, which probably people know. So, so just a word of caution, right? So when we go onto the field, we actually um, use earthworms as a soil health indicator. We uh, dig a square foot hole and we count the earthworms. We want to see about 10, but again, caution because not all of them do the same thing. Um, in this example, you know, you can probably see here where um, this is probably an anisic one where it actually is sending out deep burrows but there's other ones that actually would go in through the soil horizon and start mixing and leave their castings. And those castings are actually ones that are actually making that soil structure. We get those glues, all that uh, organic matter. Uh, the other thing too that we want to look at in terms of biology are our roots. So our roots are actually creating this whole network of, uh, so it's a network of, of a mat, right? Which is actually holding together some of the sand, silts, and clay that we actually, um, that form the soil, right? Um, now, if we look at the picture over there, um, I don't know if you guys could recognize that weed, <laughs> um, but this is a weed that actually uh, UMass right now is actually doing a lot of studies on. This is uh, crabgrass. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanna bring up is, when you look at the roots of this, you can't see any white in there, right? So completely covered, that's called rhizosheathing, right? And this is the uh, this is the portion that John just explained of where 
all of these microbes actually residing. All these exchanges that are happening um, uh, between um, particularly bacteria and fungi are happening right there. And so um, that you can also use as a indicator for soil health. If you pull out a plant and you see this beautiful sheathing on it, um, that is a great indicator of soil health because you know that uh, the microbes are actually doing their function, right? Um, and you know, and and forming the soil that we that we definitely need to uh, to have a, a proper uh, functioning plant. Uh, so the next thing are bacteria and fungi. So bacteria and fungi, um, along with the enzymes that uh, John explained, uh, that uh, go out and create these enzymes and break down rocks, they also produce glues, uh, particularly um, uh, fungal glues. Uh, so, so the bacteria will actually make glues that are for more of the micro aggregates, so the ag aggregation that we talked about. Uh, the bacteria are functioning as creating this uh, uh, bacterial glue that are for the microaggregates. Fungi, on the other hand, create macro aggregates. So they actually create more of these stable uh, forms of aggregation. And uh, this is a photo here of a compound. It's a glycoprotein called glomalin that are produced by our muscular mycorrhizae fungi. Um, and so um, these are the things that are actually holding soil together, creating these aggregates. And going back to that composition of the soil that I just explained earlier, uh, these things in combination are what actually cause these air spaces and water uh, to be present in your soil, which is what we need, right? Um, let's see. So a uh, few pointers here. Um, so soil structure as it relates to soil function. So why do we care about the soil structure in our soils? Um, so the first bullet point here sustains uh, the biological productivity. Uh, all that means is that in a soil where you actually have proper structure, you have proper air exchange, proper water, um, you can then actually continue to support the life of, uh, of the biology that's in the soil, which we now know these are the same microorganisms that are responsible for uh, plant nutrition, pest management, and flavor, right? Uh, we want to eat something that we can actually feel good about, right? Um, and, and of note too, actually, there's actually been some uh, recent studies on particular plant secondary metabolites in apples in particular, where they have found like, oh, wait, this is actually a compound that we should be studying because there's this, you know, pandemic going on. <laughs> and this particular uh, apple can produce this plant secondary metabolite, this medicine. So the whole, that, 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 that phrase that we all know about an apple a day keeps a doctor away, <laughs> there's a reason for that, but we don't have that anymore because we have lost that nutrition portion in our systems, right? So, um, so that's what we want to be actually promoting this biology. Um, another thing too about soil structure is that it develops this soil sponge. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dee Dee Peerhouse. If you are not, please Google her. She has perhaps the best analogy when it comes to uh, soil structure. So, uh, and I'll explain it very brief briefly. She uh, she essentially takes two plates one with flour and one with a piece of bread. So the piece of the, the flour, she goes ahead and pours water over it. And what happens to that flour? Just turns water. into this smush, right? And runs off, uh, it turns into mush. While the piece of bread actually takes that water and absorbs the water and retains it, right? Uh, perhaps the best analogy you can actually make uh, because that bread was actually made out of flour that's the parent material, right? You just have to create the right environment to actually create the, uh, to promote that soil structure. Which um, was microbial because you had yeast in there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, those nice little uh, pockets of air that you got, that was the yeast that created that. Um, and then finally, uh, nutrient cycling and storage. 
So whenever you actually have uh, proper soil structure, uh, you are allowing for my microbes to live in this community. Uh, and as John explained already, that nutrient cycling can occur if you're actually, if you have the proper soil structure. Without that proper soil structure, you have compacted soil and all of these functions that we're talking about earlier could just could not exist. Um, and in terms of soil uh, uh, storage or nutrient storage, all this means is that you actually now have uh, drowned, uh, you have taken the carbon because when you, we look at uh, that pyramid that John explained earlier, the very first part of this, and even with the soil food web, is the uh, complete photosynthesis. So in our minds, some, a lot of times we actually have this idea that, uh, you know, like in order to put carbon back in the soil, you need to add organic matter. That is true, but organic matter only brings you to a certain percentage every year, even with the best compost that you could be adding. So the best way to get carbon back into your soil are properly functioning photosynthesizing plants. That's the carbon that we want. That's the carbon that's gonna sustain the life. That's the carbon that we can manage as well. Uh, but you have to have a mineral uh, balance in order for you to have complete photosynthesis. And one quick thing. So John Kemp is a guy, he, basically they, there's this, you know, photosynthetic capacity, which I don't, you know, I think, especially over the last 80 years, we've all sort of thought that this plant is just this sort of inanimate, inanimate object that we put into a inert material. And it's actually not true. And unfortunately, because we've sort of had this uh, approach to growing plants over the last 80 years, we sadly have plants that are only photosynthesizing at about 20% of what their capacity is, which I think is really sad. If we can pick up that photosynthetic ability, which is getting to the top of that pyramid, which is providing real nutrition and our microbial community that supports all that, now you get a plant that's photosynthesizing at 40%. 50%, 60%, if that's happening, that plant is now gonna dump a whole lot of sugar back down into the soil because it can. Sugar is carbon. It made the sugar because it took carbon from the atmosphere, made it a complete compound and dumped it back down into the soil. So if we can turn that engine on, you're feeding your microbiome, you're getting a nutritious plant, you're putting carbon back in, you're creating all of this structure that Ruben's talking about that's gonna hold water, that's gonna hold your nutrients. Because carbon is also an incredible molecule as far as like holding things. It's called the cation exchange capacity. So all of that nutrient, nitrogen and phosphorus that end up polluting our waters, that when they're water soluble, they're gone after the first rainstorm. If you've got carbon in your soil, it doesn't go anywhere. If you've got microbes in your soil, all those uh, elements are in that body of that microbe. It's not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna stay right there in that plant rhizosphere, support the plant, create airspace, create water space, hold all that stuff because it's really important to the plant. Sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> yeah, you're actually, that's a great segue actually because, uh, that's strange actually, there's a, uh, that's a great segue into this because, uh, so what happens actually when you don't have the proper soil structure? Um, first off, runoff. Um, so, and this is actually very important for this group too, because of uh, where we're working in our spaces. So when you think about not having the proper soil structure, like John mentioned, the first rain event that you get, uh, all of those mineral amendments that you added to your soil that you spent so much money on, uh, gone. Um, and the issue with the runoff is the eutrophication in our water as a body. Uh, which is a huge problem, you know, so we're basically, if we're not properly managing uh, what we're doing at our farms, what we're doing uh, in conservation areas, what we're doing in our own gardens, 
all of that money that we spend on all these mineral amendments are going to end up in our water as a body um, and ultimately back to us uh, or the fish that we're trying to consume, uh, the, the deer that we're actually trying to consume as well. So, uh, you know, th that's a huge issue with uh, with not having the proper soil structure um, in our in our in, in the land that we're uh, uh, cultivating in. Uh, erosion is another big one. Um, so uh, I don't know how many are you from, are familiar with the Dust Bowl. Um, so erosion uh, was a it's a real thing, and so this erosion um, also caused directly by poor soil structure. If you don't have the proper soil structure, you're going to have uh, loss of topsoil. Um, there goes the organic matter, there goes the, well, there goes the organic matter, there goes the food source for your microbes because they consume this organic matter. Um, and along with that, again, everything that you actually have been trying to work on with. Uh, surface crusting too. So if you don't have the proper soil structure, uh, surface crusting could occur uh, through chemical processes, but these are also uh, directly associated with the microbial communities that are there present as well. So um, the issues with soil crusting or surface crusting is uh, whenever you're getting this surface crusting, you're going to have poor germination rates. Um, your plants are not going to be happy in these systems. Um, so these are some of the issues that we can actually see from not having uh, the proper soil structure. Um, and I think we're going to get to our last portion here. Um, and we can go ahead and just uh, go to this. So, you want to take the first one or? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so, what are the practices, uh, you know, to do to support all this thing? Minimizing, did I spell that right? <laughs> uh, physical and chemical disturbance. Um, so, when we talk about physical disturbance, that's, you know, uh, rototilling, um, actually pulverizing, mixing up these soils. <clears throat> it's difficult to do in a, you know, growing system. If you're in a market garden or uh, even your garden, um, there's, you know, people are figuring out different ways, but what, what you're doing every time you run that rototiller in or that plow in, um, besides just burning up a bunch of fossil fuels, you're pulverizing your soil microbiome, and particularly the, the fungal bits that take a long time to really grow and are super important as far as holding water, holding nutrition, creating a network um, of communication in these plants and the microbiome. And you run that rototiller through there and you just pulverized all of your hyphae, um, set it right back. So, there's some parts of this that we have to figure out, like how to do things better. Um, we've been, you know, doing a system that we're kind of used to for the last 80 years. The people are doing the no-till. When we talk about no-till agriculture um, or minimum till, uh, there's some really creative, you know, ways that we can rebuild this. And it turns out you end up with, you know, better yields, um, you know, nutritious plants again. So there's there's some things here that we don't know and we have to work on. Um, there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, most of this whole soil piece, we really don't know <laughs> what's going on. We know about 1% of what's really happening. Um, you know, so we have to be humble and observe and just apparent. Chemical disturbance is obviously chemical disturbance. Every, if we're putting out pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, uh, those are all killing things. Um, and um, killing these microbes that we're trying to foster. So if we can limit that, particularly uh, herbicides uh, and pesticides, um, the fungicides aren't wonderful, but um, you know if 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 we can if we can minimize our herbicides and pesticides, uh, we'd be doing uh, pretty good. The phys like so physical disturbance, pulverizing, shredding. Um, uh, leaving your soil uncovered is 
one of the worst things that you can do. Ruben talked a lot about compaction. Compaction, uh, you get more compaction on your soil from rain hitting bare soil. And that's gonna just drive all the oxygen out of your soil. Most of these microbes, you know, are actually, uh, you know, they need oxygen. Your plant needs oxygen in the roots of the place. So barren soil, um, you're also exposing it to the sun. And probably gonna, if we have, you know, a drought year, you're, you're losing all your water as well as just compacting everything. Uh, maintaining a living root um, and a diversity of roots. Again, the plant is driving this system by dumping exudates into the soil. So as long as you can keep a living plant in that soil, you're going to increase uh, the tilth, the humus, the microbial component, because it has that relationship. The greater diversity you have with plants and different types of roots, some plants have shallow root systems, some plants broaden root systems, some plants have a tap root. So now we're exploring the entire soil horizon and bringing a mineral component back up to the surface. And you've got this enormous pathway now for air and water to move around. And if we chop that plant off and leave the root system in the soil, that root now becomes food for this microbial community as well. So having a living plant there as long as possible, when you do need to weed, if we chop these things off, like just at the soil horizon or below the soil horizon and leave the root system in there, that's organic matter, that's microbial food. Um, we're building these things up. Um, so keeping them in there as long as possible, uh, leaving the weeded roots behind. Diversity, 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 diversity. Part of the most important thing. The, the greater diversity we have of that soil food web, the more players we have that are mineralizing. These guys are all specialists. You know, the microbes are, they're, uh, so having that diversity allows you to uh, specialize, provide the, the, the nutritional component throughout the growing season, and throughout the plant's uh, successional um, space, you know, if it's if it's in a vegetative mode or or, or, a, or a flowering mode, it needs different uh, mineral components. So you need that variety of microbes in your soil. All the different plants have different relationships with different microbes. So the greater diversity we can have in our growing systems, um, the greater diversity you're going to have with your microbial community. And now you've got just a circular economy. Um, diversity with uh, roots, diversity with the microbes, diversity with insects, pollinators, um, predatory insects. Um, there's a whole list of insects that are highly beneficial and we probably don't even understand what they're doing most of the time. Um, diversity with animals. Animals are important in these systems. They and humans are important in these systems and having a diverse group of humans in these systems is probably a good thing as well. Um, we gotta be a little careful with humans and animals because we can overdo it. <laughs> um, but uh, everything else, I don't know that we can overdo. And then I find just the biggest part of the whole thing is observing these things and being observant and being humble and maybe getting out of the way and fostering these natural processes. Um, and one of the ways to be observant is to look at your microbes. We're pretty much disconnected. It's hard to relate with these microbes because they're kind of small. <laughs> um, but if you can, and it might take some time to really understand what's going on, and we probably won't ever really understand what's going on, but you can start seeing patterns. You can start seeing, you know, this microbial herd that's working for you. Um, just like, I mean, I know there's a lot of birders, you know, in Pepperell and a lot of folks that go out and observe nature and make connections and figure out, or at least are relating 
to their environment again. We can do that, you know, with our microbes and start interacting with them in your soils and in your plant communities um, and probably cultivate health along the way and nutrition. <laughs> I do like that last piece that you put there about observation. This is this probably goes back into uh, this may be a new concept, but uh, there's a thing called in, indigenizing your mind, and uh, one of the things that we can learn from the indigenous folks is that they before before they interacted with nature and their surroundings, they did a lot more observation, and I think that we should. Probably take a you know a page out of that book and try to uh, observe more than we actually interact before we have these knee jerk reactions and that goes for many aspects of our lives you know uh, fear sometimes can take us to the wrong place um, and do irrational things so uh, the more you absorb uh, observe uh, I think the better you'll be um, so anyway so. Um, I do want to bring up uh, a few things uh, that we have going on. Um, this is a slide for a grant that NOFA Mass was actually awarded. Um, there's uh, the players at the bottom here, the Picasso Piconocket Land Trust, Global Village, Nichols College, and NOFA Mass. Uh, NOFA Mass is doing more of the health, soil health education. Nichols College is doing some of the uh, 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 educational part in terms of uh, business. Um, uh, uh, the land trust is actually doing more of the project management and Global Village is a partner farm that will be doing some of this stuff. So the reason why I'm bringing it up is because we are actually seeking beginner farmers and ranchers. So uh, anybody that is in the group and uh, has any ideas, send them our way uh, and we'll get them into this program, which is an excellent way to um, get people working on the land with the proper soil health uh, uh, education. And this can also be community gardeners. Yes. Um, it's not specific. You don't need to be a farmer. Uh, you can be a community gardener. And rancher is a term that the USDA really put into this whole program. Um, you know, small animal husbandry would suffice. <laughs> and, and even even there's even if there's like a youth program too, uh, they are considered uh, and they're associated with a, a community garden. They are uh, considered beginner farmers too. So uh, just keep that in mind and uh, let us know if you have any uh, leads. Uh, another plug-in that we have here. Yeah, uh, in a couple of weeks, so February seventeenth, eighteenth, and nineteenth. Is the uh, if anybody's more intrigued with uh, rhizophagy, uh, Dr. James White is going to be talking there on on Friday. Um, so you got an opportunity to to actually see him uh, speaking in Sturbridge. This is a cannabis conference, um, but it's not really cannabis specific. Uh, some of the other topics are a little bit more specific. Um, but uh, James White amazing human being um, and having the opportunity to hear him and probably to hang out with him uh, is interesting. Dan Kittredge is going to be talking for two sessions on Saturday. Um, and if you want to know anything about nutrition and the food system, Dan Kittredge is the um, uh, executive director uh, for the Bionutrition Food Association, which is also a Massachusetts-based organization. Um, and he will blow your mind. Um, and then Ruben and I are talking to. Yeah. Uh, Which we also have microscopes there present. So uh, we are encouraging people to bring in their samples so that we can actually give you uh, a quick uh, qualitative assessment of your soil. We're going to have two microscopes set up at the table and actually have a little space. And, um, you know, whether you have soil or not, uh, these guys do a lot of indoor grows. So they're probably going to be bringing in soil, but we'll have a monitor. Um, and you can actually, and most of these folks have uh, pretty biologically active soil. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to, uh, to see what's going on. And um, we'll definitely have two microscopes and a monitor um, and a cool little tool called the microbiometer, um, which actually gives you a, a, a biological index of, of what's going on in your soil. Um, so that'll be set up um, at the show. Here's our emails. If anybody wants to shoot us a question, 
Um, um, certainly a plug for NOFA Mass. Uh, um, you know, I encourage you to become a member. Um, we have two conferences a year typically. We try to do a lot of these, uh, um, you know, hands on workshops. Going forward, I do believe we're right now sort of putting together our, our formats as what we're going to do. Um, but uh, both Ruben and I are really interested in, you know, like let's do some more microscopy training and find groups that are interested and maybe get microscopes at libraries and, you know, teach people how to use them. Um, just so you got a clear image, like let's not even get too worried about uh, what's happening and who's doing what, but let's just get a clear image so you're not frustrated and um, and spaces to actually, you know, bring soil samples or compost teas and because that's the whole other part about like how do we build that microbiome and there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, uh, it's really helpful if you have a microscope because then you can actually see you know, which organisms we're developing. And we do know enough about the functionality of particular groups of microbes, uh, you know, to, to make some pretty good movement in our soil and make these soils higher functioning um, and do all the things that we were talking about as far as holding on to nutrition. Um, and watching insects leave in 24 hours because you dealt with the nutrition problem and the aphids aren't there anymore. Um, yeah, another thing too, uh, we currently have a uh, tri-state bulk order, um, which uh, it's, we're almost getting towards the end, but a great, great way to buy your mineral amendments, uh, supplies, tools, um, a great way to do that. Visit the NOFA website. There's a direct link to that. That's the only way I get my amendments because it's the cheapest way to do it. I encourage everybody to do the same thing. Um, also, there's uh, I host a monthly soil health call. Um, it was formerly known as a uh, minimal till, but we decided to actually expand um, the topics that we're going to be talking about. And so these are going to be um, soil health related. Um, six of these sessions are going to be specific about agroforestry and how we can actually expand agroforestry in the state of Massachusetts. So we'll have some experts in the field um, giving uh, part of this community call. Um, and we'll also have uh, additional one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So um, it's, it's an hour long. It happens every month for an hour. Uh, it's great. Uh, uh, you can get to meet uh, and talk directly to farmers and share skills, knowledge, uh, a great way to build community as well. Um, when you say agroforestry, do you mean, what do you mean exactly by that? Yeah, so the agroforestry, uh, we receive a grant, and the grant is to expand agroforestry. Agroforestry is the, uh, how you incorporate perennial plants such as uh, either nut trees, berry trees, and combine these with uh, animal input, um, and sometimes also annual um, uh, vegetables as well. Um, and we'll, and we'll get into all the details too. Uh, it's a great way for the community to get involved that are that are not very, um, that don't know much about agroforestry. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a great way to actually um, dip your, fit, uh, your foot in the water on that. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Do you, do you have, um, no, no questions for you. Do you have to have an of a soil microbe from here? By hand, by any hand. Yes. Look at. Seems like a loaded question. <laughs> 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 While he's digging, if anybody has any other questions, yeah, go ahead. I had a question. When you were talking about plants dropping their sugars and becoming carbon. Back in the soil, I was thinking back to a paper I wrote in college on um, the nutrient cycle in the rainforest. So I'm wondering, in Massachusetts, is there uh, <laughs> what, what would our nutrient cycle be like? In the rainforest, there's ten percent nutrient cycle, but everything with ten percent in a perfectly functioning um, microsystem was used as fuel for growth, and then it came back down again and refed it, and the process started and over and over again. And part of the deforestation there was once you remove that, you kill everything. 
you know, desertification. So I'm wondering in Massachusetts, if you had a perfect, perfectly functioning system, how much of that nutrient that drops off is being used again in its order? It's my understanding that if the, if the plant, there's two things. If you start providing your nutrition in these soluble nutrients, <clears throat> The plant isn't going to dump exudates in the soil anymore because it doesn't need to, because you're providing a, a water soluble form of nutrition. Most of it's probably going to go away, but the plant, it's a lot of work to photosynthesize. The plant has to make its own food. That's why it's photosynthesizing. That's why it's making sugar. That's its food source. It has to make that. It has to build that through this very complicated process that requires a lot of energy. So when you provide it a water soluble form of nutrition, it, it that process of dumping exudates stops. It's doing it as a direct correlation to the importance of the microbiome. Because the only reason why it, and it can be up to 30%, that these plants will dump 30% of their sugar into the soil. Why would it be giving away 30% of its food? Because that microbiome is so important to mineralize the soil components to provide that nutrition in order for it to physiologically make sugar. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. You want to explain your picture? Uh, yeah. So actually, this uh, what we have here, and I hope that people in Zoom can uh, uh, see this too. Um, so this is actually a sample from. Uh, compost uh, made at Upsink Farm. Uh, last year, they started making their own compost, which I'm really excited that they're doing their own compost because most commercial compost, when you look at it under the microscope, is subpar. Um, and what we saw at Upswing Farm was a good indication that they're doing the right thing. Um, here, you can actually see a few fungal hyphae. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a fungus there. Down here, you can actually see this is a testate amoeba. Uh, testate meaning that's a test or a shell. Uh, so this is the shell. So you know, typically we'd see an amoeba oozing around, uh, but these actually have made this test to protect them from the environment. Um, this over here may be a smaller one too. It can't. How does how does it mineralize the rock? Like, does it? Look Chemicals on it or like enzymes, 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 yeah. uh, and it, in particular, the, the uh, fungi and bacteria are the ones doing that. Um, and they create different sets of enzymes. Um, fungi are more complex where they can actually make way more different types of enzymes, so they can digest different food sources. Bacteria are much more of specialists where they uh, create specific types of enzymes which goes back to what John was saying earlier about diversity. So the, the higher diversity you have in these microorganisms, they can actually digest different foods, which they can then bring back to the plant. Originally, the planet was just a big rock. We didn't have soil <laughs> until these guys started making soil, which was, you know, fungi and bacteria are probably the oldest organisms on the planet. And whenever they came and hit planet Earth, they started breaking down the rock that was earth. And then you had soil formation. And then we started having a situation where plants could evolve. But the only reason we have soil on planet earth is because of bacteria and fungi, to the best of my understanding. You had a question? Yes. Um... So uh, a couple of things. So you were saying about co compost when we're you know doing our home composting that it's a kind of a bare percentage of what you would get with nutrients in your in your soil in a sense. So what's the other what's the other part of it is leaving now I try to experiment in my little teeny four by twelve plot of garden. Um, you know I I've left weeds there. You know, you might cut the tops off, you might pull them out either way. Um, and I think that at the end of the season, if you don't pull them out, but you take them out in the spring and then plant, it's probably better, right? I would imagine. Uh, or would you just leave all the roots there and plant around them? I mean, what do you do? What I tend to do, so there's 
It's a couple of different things here now. Uh, the compost that we're making, one of the biggest benefits when we're making compost is, is organic matter back into our soils, but also the microbial piece. And what Ruben just mentioned about a lot of compost is you don't necessarily have the microbial piece. So that's a biomass. You're looking, when we're looking at compost, we're looking for a large biomass and a diversity in that biomass. That group of that diversity and the biomass, if, if, if it's in our composts and we're bringing that to our gardens, whether it's through teas and extracts, which is a whole other talk, um, you're bringing a group of organisms. And if we can push, and I noticed one question in the chat about fungal to bacteria ratio, so I'm glad you asked this. If we can make, most of our soils are bacterially dominant. And there's, a, there's a, a succession. When we look at the relationship of the types of plants that are growing in soil and the soil microbiome, when you have a bacterially dominated soil on this end of the spectrum and a fungally dominated soil on this end of the spectrum, you have this succession of plants from weeds to an old growth forest. Our soils, because of physical and chemical disturbances are bacterially dominated. You're always gonna have bacteria. All of the surfaces in this room are covered in bacteria. We're covered in bacteria. Our soils are full of bacteria. Bacteria are really tough and they're everywhere. So if your soils are bacterially dominated, you're gonna end up with weeds because weeds are succession plants. They're dealing with the disturbance. They're actually trying to fix the soil. They're trying to move it up. They've only got a relationship with bacteria. Over time, them growing and decaying and growing and decaying, you might end up getting some organic material and some more diversity in your soil food web. And you might move that into uh, grasses or annual vegetables or um, shrubs and then moving up to the woodlands. We can kind of push that. So when we make composts that are fungally full, <laughs> now we're bringing in a fungal component. When we stop tilling and when we have mulches and when we have diversity of plants, you're gonna start creating a fungal community now. We might change that fungal to bacteria ratio and bring it to like a one-to-one. -one. Now, all of a sudden, we've got a microbial community that can support higher level plants, what we call higher level plants. Mm -hmm. And your weeds don't have these relationships and you're not gonna have that weed pressure anymore. And I've seen this with a woman that I've been working for the last three years. What, what you end up seeing is the weeds because they don't have the microbial community anymore. They're the ones covered with bugs. Mm -hmm because they don't have the nutrition anymore. They're digestible to aphids. Mm -hmm. And you can have uh, pigweed right next to your tomato plant. Pigweed's covered with aphids. Mm -hmm. Tomato plant's fine, it's rocking. Well, how do you get the fungal portion in the compost? So yeah, then, then that's a whole other, like, yeah. so, but that's what we're working for is that diversity, a fungal component in our compost. We're actually building compost with intention. Not just a big part of composting, which is really important, is processing waste. There's no question. Like we can process a lot of waste with compost. Might not have the microbial community that we're really looking for to grow food or to grow anything. But there are some sectors of that composting world that we could be making these biocomplete composts that are more intended for, uh, you know, growing in our food systems and growing in your garden. Um, and that has that, you know, biological component that we're looking for that we can see in our microscopes and know that you're bringing a fungal component to your garden and then you're gonna move things along and not have that weed problem that you have anymore. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the real magic with compost. But compost isn't compost isn't compost. Uh, there's a lot going on. Do you take the no-till to the home garden as well? Do I would. That? Yeah. Totally. Totally. What I do in my garden? Japanese weeder. Japanese weeder cutting those weeds off right at the uh, just below the soil horizon. Uh, the hori hori knives. I don't know yeah. if people know those things, but yeah. that's like the best tool ever made because it's been around forever. Um, but you can just chop. 
you can go through and chop everything right at the soil horizon, leave it there, let it, yeah. don't worry about taking it away, just drop it. Now you left the root in there. Chances are because you cut it at the soil horizon, it might not come back. A lot of weeds are pretty tough. You know, they probably are going to come back, but just keep chop, chop and drop, chop and drop. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, to your question about the, uh, the uh, compost, uh, upswing is part of a, a grant that we have going on. We have five different farms which were evaluating compost and adding um, spent mushroom substrate to the finished compost. Uh, the initial results are looking really promising. Um, and, um, and I'm sure that we can actually share this uh, with the group once we have a final report. Um, but Upswing may be actually hosting something, uh, which you can all be invited to as well, actually, uh, as they are part of this grant. Um, I do want to go back to the uh, chat because there were a few questions here. Um, and Ralph Baker, you uh, had a question about the fungal to bacteria ratios, which John actually incidentally talked about already. Did that answer your question? You can come off of the uh, off of mute or um... yes, that was that was really good. <clears throat> I also I asked that's a follow-on question. By the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's nematodes have nematode. a bad rap. A lot of people think, oh, nematodes, and there's root feeding nematodes that are a problem and can be problematic, but most nematodes in our soil are highly beneficial. And you don't see these guys unless you've got a functioning soil food web. This is like the lion in the jungle. This is an apex predator. Um, realistically, if you have a microscope and you're scanning things and you see one nematode on your slide, you're probably going in the right direction because the soil food web that has to be under this guy to support him has to be diverse, has to be full, has to be complicated, or else he's not going to be there. What's the scale there? Yeah, I was just going to ask the same thing. This is uh, 1 to 40. Uh, so 400. 400x total magnification. So Ruben, if I may just... Uh, for the people on Zoom, a uh, couple questions here. Um, for the monthly calls, you can send us an email. Um, with our contact information there, uh, or you can also go onto our website. Um, the information's there. Uh, for the agroforestry, uh, or sorry, for the uh, beginner farmer, um, that you don't necessarily have to be uh, producing or selling commercially to be considered a beginner farmer. Um, is there a question in the audience here that we can take? If you wanted to bring up the uh, ratio of your uh, the fun the fungus, what would you what what would you be composting in order to raise that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's what I was wondering. Yes, yes. So, so the question was, how do you increase fungal activity in your compost? Um, and I wouldn't be too concerned about, and this is something that I'm learning through this uh, grant that we have right now. Um, initially, we set out to say, okay, uh, commercial composting does not have much fungal activity. So we said, okay, well, let's introduce fungi right. at, the, at, the, at the end where it's already at the matur uh, maturation, maturation process, right? Uh, when, when it's cooled down already, it's not gonna heat up again. Let's add more fungi directly. What I found was, and very interesting, and probably more importantly, it wasn't fungi that actually that came to the party. It was a great diversity of players that came to the party, specifically nematodes, uh, specifically uh, certain bacteria. And so uh, it increased overall diversity um, of that. But to your question, um, foods that actually are more complex that bacteria don't, because you know, remember we talked about how bacteria make certain enzymes, Fungi make more complex enzymes. And so when you produce, when you give uh, the, your compost pile a uh, more complex uh, set of uh, food, meaning like high cellulose material, uh, material that uh, uh, bacteria can't easily digest and that the fungi can actually outcompete the bacteria for the food, that's what you want to be adding. Uh, but in general, you want to be adding a diverse set of food to your compost uh, because that's when you actually get the best. Uh, uh. And then there's also uh, different types of composting. Um, I have found that when you do static composting, where you just pile these things up in a you know 
in a pile and let it sit there, uh, you'll have greater fungal activity there because you're not turning it, right? Because this is the same thing about uh, 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 turning the soil, right? Mm -hmm. When you're turning your soil, you're doing the same thing. You're actually uh, breaking up the fungal hyphae. Um, so same thing, when you actually have a static compost pile, you'll have more uh, uh, of a fungal activity in there. Typically those are brown. When you're composting, you're always dealing with the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, and you're dealing with greens and browns. The brown foods are your wood chips and your leaves and uh, maybe straws, things that um, were, you know, uh, pretty dried out when you harvested them, but they've got, you know, cellulose and lignans and woody materials that, that uh, you know, most fungi, that's what they break down. You know, they like woodlands. They're, they're, they're eating the detritus that's on that forest floor. Uh, so those woodier materials, um, the fungi tend to like. Also fats. Um, if you are dealing with animal products, um, you know, dead animals, um, uh, they, they like that real fatty material. Fish hydrolysates and fish emulsions, uh, you can incorporate those into your um, into your compost piles, and uh, and and that'll pick up that whole piece. Um, uh, so that tends, and the, but you also have to think about the structure. And to Ruben's point, you know, this is sort of a beef I have with with some of the organic compost requirements. You have to turn your compost three to five times. Um, and they're, you know, they're doing that because they're trying to get rid of pathogens, but we're also destroying this whole fungal network that we're really trying hard to build. And I think that there's better ways. Like if you're worried about E. coli, let's test for E. coli. Let's not make a standard that I have to turn this five times because I and people are doing it. There's this Johnson Sioux technique where they don't turn it at all. And the fungal component in these compost piles is enormous. Um, you know, so let's maybe look at that. And if you're worried about pathogens, particularly E. coli, let's just test for E. coli, because, you know. And even then, you know, all E. coli is not bad either. <laughs> this goes back to the whole issue of, you know, trying to. There's a lot of debate of what's good and what's bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that goes back to the issue of us trying to be reactive about stuff and say, okay, well, we have to kill the bacteria because it's gonna harm us. Well, what about, this whole consortium of, of organisms, can they take care of that? Can they actually outcompete that pathogen? It's this is what we're seeing. Like if you're if, like lactobacillus is a, is a is, it's a it's a it's basically the police of our soil. So and again, are you putrefying something? Are you fermenting something? Or are you composting something? And there's a lot of dynamic situations in all of that. You know, and we have to be cognizant of it. How much air is in it? How much water is in it? What's the food source? Because um, that's going to end up either putrefying, fermenting, or composting. And there's good things in all of those. So I have a question about um, what you're inputting in your compost. Um, I try to eat mostly organic because that's where they're higher in nutrients than uh, conventionally grown Maybe. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well. well no, they should be. They should be, right? Uh, um, so if people are put composting um, pesticide laden vegetables, is that is that gonna survive in your soil? And is that gonna hopefully anything, um, any of the good stuff from happening in your compost? Hopefully the pesticide residue that's on that that you just consumed um is at a level that's low enough that you're active compost pile can remediate it. There's probably a microbe out there to remediate everything that we consider toxic. I mean, they're seeing it in Chernobyl. You know, mushrooms are actually like binding up the radioactive material. Oh, mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> um, it'll be interesting to see where PFAS goes. We've got a whole issue of forever chemicals that are coming down the pipe, which are probably gonna get bound up to carbon and probably be okay. I don't know. Um, to your point, though, if if yes, I think that uh, there are things you know, glyphosate um, is a pretty enduring chemical, but uh, 
until we start doing bigger studies, I guess we don't really know. Um, but I do know that, you know, diversity, 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 most of the microbes that are in our world are highly beneficial for us. There's a very, very small group that are bad. And they're usually bad when we've sterilized everything and we take away the competition and then they flourish and explode. So again, diversity, diversity, diversity. Mm -hmm. so I'm sure we have a lot more questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Our time. Yes. So um, for folks on Zoom and here, let's give them a big round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And feel free Thank to stick you. around, right? Yeah. Open yeah. Open we'll phone. just we'll be so. shutting down the Zoom, and we got to shoo you guys out of the library so these folks can go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sue, for doing all this. I periodically read they're allowing the